Thank you, Brother Roy. You may be seated. I certainly deem this a grand privilege to be here in this lovely city tonight with you Christians who are pilgrims and strangers to this earth, and we are professing that we are looking for a city that whose builder and maker is God claiming to be the royal seed of Abraham. Those are in Christ are Abraham's seed and are heirs with him according to the promise, bringing greetings to you from other Christians around the world. I'm sure that they'd like to be here, all of us together tonight for the worship service, but we are looking for the time when we will be together for the worship service when we crown him King of kings and Lord of lords. We are, I was just understanding that we got here just at this time when several of the organizations are having, um, I believe, a convention. I'm sorry that we arrived at that time because I know how you feel. I know how the brethren feel to be uh, something like this to happen just at the time. They're having their convention. And uh, Brother Eddie Bisco, my brother and friend, uh, it's the only time we could be here just passing through, and that's the reason we made it real quick, just three services, and we're traveling on. And um, we are hope that God will grant a great blessing for our gathering together and trust that they'll have one of the greatest camp meetings or conventions or whatever they're having that they've had in years, trusting that God will be with them and help them. Now, it's good to visit around and see all the children of the Lord. Been, I've never been on the island before. We just left up here at Port Avernia, and there where we met with our Indian friends and many of the white people, and we had a glorious three nights meeting with them. I was supposed to have been here last spring, and I could not come at that time because of a blow-up of a rifle that I was shooting targets, and I picked up a rifle that had not been bored out right and it exploded right in my face and almost made me blind for a few days and deaf and uh, very bad. It should have, according to the way it should have been, looked like it should have blowed my whole body off from my waist. It was about 6,800 pounds of pressure come right back with the whole rifle and all in my face and scope and it uh, never even scarred me. So I, I'm thankful for that. But I was just couldn't hardly see and kind of hard hearing for a few days, like ringing of bells. And I was supposed to leave about a day before. And we just set the meeting up to this time. And it's the only time I could be because we was to be right over here in Washington. And that's the reason we come. And if there's anyone here from the leaders of these conven- this convention that's going on, you tell them that I didn't do this purposely because they had the convention. I just did it because I dropped by and some people that couldn't attend the convention or the camp meeting, whatever it is, well, I might be able to come by and we'd have a little time of fellowship with them. They had their program, of course, already set up, or maybe I could have went out to the camp or whatever it was and spoke with them. But they, I had to let them know beforehand because they have, have their program set up. I certainly wouldn't want to come in when somebody else and take someone else's place. And these, we are here to pray for the sick people and to pray with the lost. If there's any comes in to be prayed for, we'd be glad to do that. And to just fellowship around the Word. I like that. Have fellowship around God's Word. Now, if you know any sick that's not attending the camp or a convention, well, you um, get on the phone in the morning, call them up. Let's get them all out here and pray for them. And maybe the Lord might heal them. I believe he will. Now, I do think that Christianity is convincing. And it's if it is preached in its simplicity, and God will reveal Christianity in a living presence. Now, if it comes to just ritual, creed, it isn't very convincing. Because it's, it's too uh, misunderstood. It's, uh, there's something wrong with it. That's when man has uh, contaminated it with adding dogma and 
so forth to it, then it isn't convincing at all. But just to see the plain Bible, just read and see it moved and lived among the people, I think it's very astounding myself. I, I really love it. And maybe I, I'm a Southerner, and everybody since I've been here tell me I talk funny. I hope I don't talk funny to you, because I tried to get out of it as much as I could to try to speak like you Canadians, but I, I just haven't got it in me. <laughs> I, I just just can't do it. <laughs> so I, I hope that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what I'm trying to get to you, my, my words. And now, we believe that it is, uh, Christianity is convincing, and then we come not representing any certain denomination, but representing all of them. And the way of, we believe that Christ is the head of the church, which he has purchased with his own blood, and by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. We, we believe that we join our different organizations, but we're baptized in one body, Christ, and by the Holy Spirit. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. I've always made a little remark, oh, not always, but several times saying, you know, I belonged to the Branham family for 53 years, and they never did ask me to join the family. <laughs> I was born to Branham. <laughs> and that's why I think that we are Christians. We are born Christian. Now, we have our organizations, and many times the all the Methodists, Presbyterian, Catholic, Anglican, and so forth, try to say that we are a Pentecostal organization. That's an era. We, you cannot organize Pentecost. Pentecost is an experience for all believers. See? It's an experience. I have many Anglican friends who has the Holy Ghost. I have many Methodists. I just helped lead 400 Lutherans to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. See, And so there's a whole Bethany College received the Holy Ghost at one time. So, see, it, it's not, a, it's not a, an organization. It's an experience for anybody that wishes it. In Africa, amongst the heathens and Hottentots, I've seen 30,000 blanket natives receive it at one time. So, see, in India, where we had at Bombay, the largest gathering I ever spoke to in my life at one gathering. Oh, around half a million, I guess. But I've seen thousands times thousands of them. Un innumerable that I couldn't even see how many there was, except Christ the Savior at one time. And they, brought, they were Mohammedans, Hindus, Buddhists, Sikh, Jains, and what more, see? But they, they all received Pentecost, see? Because that it's for whosoever will may be a partaker of it. And Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all that the Father has given me will come to me. And he that comes, of course, has eternal life with the assurance of being raised up again at the last day. So what an assurance and a rest it is to be a Christian. To know that in this day, that when the world is so nervous... Now, I don't know how the Canadian people are feeling now, but the Americans are putting on one of the biggest bluffs that i ever seen, just like most of the rest of the world. They're acting like they're not afraid, but they're scared to death. They're hiding the government in all kinds of places and digging down in the ground. It reminds me of a little boy passing a graveyard at nighttime, whistling, says he's awful brave. <laughs> he's just whistling in the dark. <laughs> Their actions speak louder than words, because the time has come where we will not need military forces anymore, just one fanatic to pull a trigger, the whole world will be blown up. I do not believe it will happen. God cannot defeat his own purpose. The earth was put here, and there will be a millennial reign upon the earth for a thousand years after the church is done taken home. So the earth isn't going to be blown up. So just well, rest assured that it isn't going to happen. Just a bluff and... When these sights begin to come to pass, then lift up our heads. Redemption's drawing nigh. Don't look down and be weary. We're just coming to the place for the coming of our Lord Jesus. Instead of being weary, we should be the most happiest people in the whole world. And we are. We are. 
because we're not afraid of bombs. Uh, bombs doesn't bother us. And as I said the other night, you cannot dig far enough to get away from it. While we wasn't made moles, we were made to live on top of the earth, see? Live in peace and love, trusting God. And they're trying to build bomb shelters and construct them with steel. Why, if you dig a million feet under the earth, why, you'd still be lost as soon as the bomb hit. If it hit anywhere than 100 or 200 miles from you, why, that concussion would break every bone in your body. Down there, it would blow a hole 150 yards deep and for 150 miles square. And that's the one they let us know about. We don't know what they got they haven't let us know about. But, you know, there's one good thing. You know, science can work out all kinds of things, but God's way ahead of that. We have a bomb shelter. It's not made out of steel. It's made out of feathers under his wings. We're resting. As soon as it explodes, before it explodes, we'll be gone on into a land where there's no sickness, sorrow, where old age will be renewed back to youth and there be that way forever. Isn't that consolation for especially us old people? (laughs) The youth, but just remember, it's just a turn of the sun. I was speaking at Aquinas here not long ago. And there was one fine doctor, several doctors were present, and they were asking me about mission life and so forth. And one fine doctor, nice man, seemingly, but he just couldn't believe that uh, of the virgin birth, and he just said he couldn't believe there was God. And I said, I never want you to put an operating knife on me. <laughs> I'd be afraid to trust you, doctor, if you didn't uh, believe in God. And... Um, so another specialist was standing by my side, which was a staunch believer. And he said, well, I think anything that isn't scientifically proven is not real, Mr. Branham. He said, I believe in science. I said, so do I. I believe you can climb up the tree of science until you get to the end of it. Then you step over on the tree of faith and just keep on climbing. I said, because it's a, I believe in climbing up the tree. He said, well, anything that cannot be scientifically proven isn't a reality. Oh, I said, doctor, that's an awful statement for you to make. And he said, "Um, why is that? I said, I'll take the vice versa. Anything that can be scientifically proven is not a reality. Oh, he said, you talk, Brother Bram, like you were disturbed. (laughs) Well, I said, when you say there isn't any God, you talk like you're delinquent. (laughs) So the fool is said in his heart, there's no God. Yeah. So we got to talking real plain to each other. And I said, now look, doctor, are you a married man? He said, I am. I said, do you love your wife? He said, if I didn't, I wouldn't have married her. Do you have children? Yes. I said, then what is the difference of the love that you have for your wife and you would for any other woman? Oh, he said, because she's my wife. My children, mother of my children. I said, that's right. See, I caught him right in his own trick, man. I said, what was that you said? You loved her? He said, yes. I said, how do you know you love her? He said, well, of course I know I love her. I said, all right, then what is love? Scientifically show me. Let's go down to the drugstore and you inject me a pound of it inside my veins. I need it. (laughs) Then according to him, there is no such a thing as love because you can't scientifically prove what's in you that's love. Yeah. The whole Christian armor is faith, unseen. See? What is a Christian armor? Love, joy, peace, faith, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, patience, Holy Spirit, God, angels. It's all supernatural. And everything natural come from the earth and will return back to the earth. It's just the supernatural things that live. It's eternal. I had a little thing to him. I said, Doctor, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe man was made out of the dust of the earth? He said, Oh, I I could I believe that man is dust of the earth. Yes, sir. Said, you see, you eat the food and the food turns into the blood and the blood builds tissue and therefore it come, you eat the like you eat meats and so forth and it builds calcium, potash, and whatever iron you need for your body, and it builds it up. I said, therefore, maybe under another way, you believe that man came from the dust of the earth, but God in the beginning never created the original man that we are products of. And he said, maybe that's the way you'd state it. So I said, I'd like to ask you a question. 
And uh, I said, now, we're going to say something here. I'll, is it so that I'm made of 16 elements? You admitted that. Yes. Of the earth. Now, then when I was 15 years old, uh, I was a strong, sturdy little boy. And now every time I eat, you say I, the food makes blood cells. I said, that's correct. I said, then every time I eat, I renew my life. That's correct. Blood is a life. A life is a blood, sure. Yeah. Every time I eat, I renew my life. He said, that's correctly. I said, then as long as I eat, why should I ever die? See? As long as you stuff food in there, why would I ever die? Yeah. See? Because it's blood cells that I live by, and food makes blood cells. And then if, if I renew my life, I said, here's another thing I'd like to ask you. When I was 16, I eat the same food I eat right now, but now I eat more and better. And when I was 16, 15, 16, every time I eat, I got bigger and stronger. And then all at once when I hit, according to about 21 years old, from that to about 23, I was on a standstill. Now I'm 50. I eat the same food I eat then, and why is it I'm getting weaker and burning down all the time instead of growing up when I'm eating the same food, putting the same kind of life in me. Yes. There's one for you. Yes. Here, if I've got a jug in my hand or a pitcher pouring water into a glass and I'm pouring water out of this big full jug or glass or pitcher into a glass and it gets half full and then I pour faster and the more I pour further down it goes, scientifically prove me what happened in the glass of water. No answer to that. No. See? Well, that's the same thing. I put food in my body at 16. At one year old on to 16 on, when I was born, I started eating food of the earth. And I started getting stronger and stronger and larger, being a bigger man all the time. And all at once it stops. I pour the same food in. It keep going down like this when it's pouring the food in, going up like that. There is no answer for it. Amen. God yeah. has made an appointment. Yeah. There's where it stays. Therefore, of scientists, of education, of everything there is in the world, I base my faith upon the Word of God, and that alone. I come from a Catholic background, being an Irishman. My people, before me, not father and mother, but the next generation, come from Dublin, Ireland, and were, and were Catholic. When I was known of God when I was a little boy, I wanted to find out about who God was, and my people didn't go to church. So I asked the priest about God, and he said, God is in his church. That's where God dwells. You have to belong to his church. I said, how must I belong? Of course, you Catholic people understand what I was told. Then I come to find out that I played in a German neighborhood where I was raised, of people named Halman, Roderwick, Fisher, Roder, so forth. I was the only one more boy, and I were the only Irish boys in the whole school. Well, these boys were all Lutheran. Well, they said they their church was a church. Then I come to find out there was another church called Baptist, Presbyterian, Anglican. Oh my! Well, which one of them churches is he in? That's what I wondered. Where is he at? If this one's right, this one's got to be wrong because they're contrary one to another. Now, which one of them churches is God in? I sat down and started reading the Bible, watching nature, come to find out that the Bible said that whosoever shall take anything out of this Bible or add anything to it, the same will be taken from his part of the book of life. Yes. So I seen that God will judge the world one day by Jesus Christ and his word. Now, therefore, I believe the Bible. I believe God can do things that's not wrote in his word. But as long as he does just what he's got in the word, then I'm satisfied with that. Now, some of you brethren, remember in the Old Testament, they had a way of finding out whether a prophet was telling the truth or a dreamer was dreaming right. His dream was from God. They take him to the temple where the breastplate of Aaron was hanging. And it was called Urim Athundam. Many of you people know about it, reading in the Bible. And with this prophet begin to prophesy, and those supernatural lights didn't re register back off of that like a rainbow across that, making the Urim Thundam from that breastplate. No matter how real it sounds, they didn't believe it. No, sir. It had to be answered back by God. Now, the Old Testament was done 
away with and fulfilled, not done away, but fulfilled. And when it did, we took a New Testament. Now the old Urim Thundam was back in the Levitical priesthood under Aaron's breast. But this time we have two more tables of law, the New and Old Testament. And that's God's Urim Thundam to me. If God doesn't speak back to his word when we see something, then I just leave it alone. But as long as it's the word, then I know that heavens and earth will pass away, but his word will never fail. Therefore, I believe the Bible to be the absolute truth of God. And it isn't to be added to or taken away from, but just live, preached in its simplicity, live the way it's wrote. And God is, if he ever was God, he's still God. And if this is his word and he made a promise that he cannot back up, then he isn't God. And I found this far, friends. I'm 31 years behind the platform. Folks, I have never seen anything that he promised but what he would do it. That's right. I've asked him for things I didn't get, but I've never asked him sincerely for anything but what he gave it to me or told me why he couldn't give it to me. There's many things I don't know. I'm finite. He's infinite. So the great infinite God and I, a finite man, there's many things that I desire that wouldn't be good for me to have, so I just trust him as my father to give me what's right. And we're here tonight to pray with you and talk to you about the Word, these next three meetings, tomorrow night and Sunday afternoon. And I trust that you'll give me your undivided attention, and I'll stay nowhere but right in the pages of the book, and I don't preach doctrine out in the meetings. I'm out here to keep the message simple, to pray for all of God's children, and the religious questions that you might have in your mind, I would advise you to ask your pastor and not me, because... Every man's leading his flock, and if he's the pastor's led you safely this far, trusting the rest so he, if he's brought you up to be filled with God's Spirit and living the life that I trust that you're living, while well, trusting the rest way, he be able to answer your questions. Now, believing the Word, we have just a little a formal message that we introduce each campaign with, and that is the subject of Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If, now, we know that that is the Bible, Hebrews 13, 8. And now I have another piece of Scripture that I want to read, and then that's found in St. John 12, 20, and just talk a few minutes on the Scripture and pray for the sick. Try to let you out early, because I know city people has city jobs, and they must punch the clock, and we're not here in a uh, one of the big campaigns, but I hope someday that we can return so we can have a week or two that we'll... But it's just a little introductory meeting. You will, of course, have not be able to grasp, I'm sure, the full meaning of the meeting that we're talking about and how the Holy Spirit... But I ask you as my friend and as a Christian believer here tonight that you'll search what we say by the Scripture. And if it's not scriptural then you owe it to me to tell me about it. Show me where it's wrong. And if it is scriptural, then you're duty-bound to obey the Scripture. Amen. Now, before we read, let us speak to the author as we bow our heads. Amen. With our heads bowed, I wonder in the, here in my own heart tonight if there is request that, will, that you have on your heart that you want God to fulfill during this meeting. Would you just raise up your hands with your heads bowed and in your heart say, Lord Jesus, I want you to answer my request during this meeting. I have someone sick. I'm sick myself. I have a lost friend, brother, sister, child, husband. Remember them, Father God. During this meeting, may something happen that they'll be saved and healed. God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, we approach thy throne of grace at this time and this hour believing that you will answer each request. We thank thee for this uh, loyal, and as the we put it, royal Canadian gathering. And Lord, we want to be loyal to our God. So we have assembled out in this hot afternoon to worship him in the spirit of his truth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll bless our being. Bless those brethren 
that's uh, got the campaign going on, we pray that you'll be in those meetings, Lord, and give to them the exceeding abundantly above all that they could do or think. Now we ask tonight for these requests. These people got something on their heart. Most all the congregation tonight had their hands up. There's something beneath that hand, Lord, in the heart. Won't you grant it to them? Now, I offer my prayer as they pray silently. I pray to you that my prayer is that you'll answer their request. I lay my prayer with theirs up on your golden altar with that sacrifice, the Lord Jesus. Hear us, God. He told us, you ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, we pray that you'll grant this request and give us a great lovely time together as we fellowship around the Word. For we ask it in Jesus' name, thy Son. Amen. <clears throat> now, in the book of St. John 12, and the, the, we're going to begin uh, at the 20th verse and read the 20th and 21st verse. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, a Galilee, and desiring him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, for a, a subject, I would like to take that. We would see Jesus. A text, Hebrews 13:8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now let's look right straight into the face of the Word of God. <clears throat> now the Bible said here that there were Greeks that came up to worship that had heard about Jesus and came to one of his disciples to see if they could see him, and they were granted that privilege. Now the how many here would like to see Jesus, just truly from your heart? All of us. See my hands? Well, then the question is this. Now, if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and our desire is the same desire of those Greeks, why can't we see him? I see you can't make the Bible say something wrong because it doesn't. Now, if God is God, he's got to stand by this word. He must keep that word in order to be God. Now, these Greeks desired to see him. He's no respective person, the Bible says. And they desired to see him, and they was granted the privilege of seeing him. Now, the Scripture doesn't say they talked to him. They just saw him. And that's what we want to do. We want to see him. Now, we know that he was... He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He crucified, died, buried, rose the third day, and ascended into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of the majesty of God on however living to make intercessions upon our confession. We know that. And he is right now a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. We know the Bible teaches that, the New Testament. Now, if our desire tonight as a congregation of people that's assembled together, there was only two then, and they got to see him, and now there's perhaps 150, and we want to see him. So if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, let's see him and see what he was. What type of person do you think those Greeks were looking for? Were they looking for a rabbi with his uh, robes on and a turban hat? Well, any man could have wore robes with a turban hat. Any man today could do the same thing. So if we seen a man and wanted to see Jesus, which was Messiah, the anointed Christ, then we could see any man that wore a turban and a, and a cloak like they'd have thought he'd have wore like a priest. That would have been Jesus. It'd be very confusing than to see as many men in dresses like that. So they did not want to see his dress. So maybe they wanted to see his stature. Maybe how high he was, how large shoulders that he would have, or the certain fashion he, he wore his hair or something. Then any man could impersonate that. But they wanted to see the anointed one. 
So if they wanted to see the anointed one, they would, they would be looking for a anointed Christ. Now, the Bible said, I'm reading in St. John, we're going back to the first chapter of St. John and see just what he was. We're almost in the middle, 12th chapter now of St. John. Let's go back to the first of St. John to see what he was. And if we can find out what he was, then we know what he is. Is that right? Yes. Then we'll know what we're looking for. Now, if he should come to this lovely city on this beautiful island here of Victoria here, and we would be looking for him, and we are tonight, and here's his promise that he's the same, then we've got to find out what we're looking for. If we would, we, if it's dress, we'd probably go down and see perhaps maybe an um, uh, Orthodox priest might have dressed the way he did, or, or some Jew. He didn't dress any different from the common street man. But he just wore a, a regular garment. He didn't dress any religious clothes because he walked in around man and they never noticed who he was because his dress was like the common man. I believe if he was here today, he'd be a clean looking man, wear a suit, a tie, just like any other man. He wouldn't be all garbed up in religious clothes. I don't believe he'd do that. I, I don't think the feather makes the bird. And it's the nature of the bird, because the most beautiful birds we have are scavengers. So we, the feather doesn't make the bird. So it was the, something in him that these Greeks wanted to see. And that's what we want to see tonight. We want to see not... Now, if we'd say, let's go down in town and look around, they tell me Jesus is in this city. Let's go look for him. If we would look and go down on the street and find a man that had scars in his hand and nail prints and around his forehead here he had thorn marks and the blood had went down his face and we found him with nail scars in his feet, any hypocrite could have that. Amen. Sure. Anybody. We've got to look for what he was. Yeah. The person of Jesus. So now, let's see what the person of him was. Now, John said in the first chapter, In the beginning was the Word. Now, a word is a thought expressed. Amen. It's a thought first. You think it, then you speak it. And he was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Is that right? Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, because it was his thought before he had expressed it, and it was God, and when he expressed it, it became God, because the Word is a part of God, just like you're a part of your Word. And when he expressed it, it became God, and that Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld him, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. Praise now, if he was the Word then, expressed and manifested Word, then it'd have to be the same thing tonight. Because when God speaks, he can never take it back. See, that's the way you must have confidence in your Bible. It is, your Bible is this, God wrote on paper in word form, because it is God. Even the Old Testament, the Bible said that the word of God came to the prophets. Prophets, the word of God came to them. Now, when Jesus is here on earth, he said to them, they did not believe him. He was an ordinary man. And he called himself God. He said, when you make yourself equal with God, we know you're mad. And the word mad there, of course, we understand, means crazy. And um, you're crazy. You're a Samaritan. You've got a devil and so forth. But Jesus said, search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Amen. They are they that bear witness of me. Testify is to bear witness. When you go to a trial to be a witness, you're testifying for somebody. See? And Jesus said, the Scriptures are they that bear record of me. Then he was God's Word expressed in human flesh. You see it? 
God's Amen. promise made flesh to express itself. That's what Christ was. The Word of God expressed in human form. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Again he said to them, If I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. But though you don't believe me, believe the works. See, that's God expressing himself through the flesh. He was God made flesh, the Word, living Word. That's the reason, Christians, I think it's so real tonight and so uh, that we should live the right kind of a life. Amen. Because, you see, there's many people won't take time to read the Bible, but they'll read you. Yeah. See, you are a written epistle of God. A real, true, born-again Christian is the Word expressed again because you're written epistles of God read of all men. What type of person should we to be if we know that our lives is an open living Bible to the unbeliever? Amen. To express God in our own life. Notice, now we see He was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now we find out that in Hebrews, you're writing it down, Hebrews 4.12, the Bible said that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the sunder and the mire of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. The Word of God discerns the thought that's in your heart. Therefore, God tonight, being the Word, knows exactly what you're even thinking about this very minute. So should not our thoughts be pure, clean, holy? Always thinking the best. Jesus said to the Pharisees, said, How can you speak good things? For out of the said you hypocrites, said, Out of the abundance of the heart speaketh the mouth. See, they were thinking something in their heart and speaking something different with their mouth, so that made them hypocrites. Said, How can you speak good things when out of the abundance of the heart? He knew what was in their heart. See? How can you say good things? when out of your heart you should speak. Therefore, we should never speak anything but what we believe and understand and let it be pure and undefiled and and holy and let our conversations be clean and pure. Our thoughts, uh, thinking the best thing, thinking God's thoughts, staying up on God's program and away from the things of the world. It's too bad that... The things of the world has so captured the church in these days. And Satan had a rude way of doing it, to bring in the televisions right into the homes and things and corrupting the minds of the people until today that, that a great percent of the church that calls themselves Christians will stay home from prayer meeting on a Wednesday night to get to see some favorite program of somebody from Hollywood or somewhere that oughtn't even be put out. Uh, on the screen, maybe living with three or four husbands or wives and carrying on and living all kinds of life, go out on drunk parties and smoking and lying and everything that can be done that's wrong. And our churches are fashioning themselves. Even our dress in this day becomes after Hollywood. What a pity it's got to be that our minds think can't stay pure and holy with Christ. It's done something to the church. It's crippled it. And it's done a horrible thing. All of our papers and everything just seems to be corrupted. But listen, friends, it's in that hour of corruption, in that time of corruption, that God draws himself a bride. It comes out of that corruption. That's what he's looking for, to get a church that's called by his name, somebody that looks for a life that has no end. What if they give you tonight a time that you could live 10,000 years and be all the, the king over the whole earth? Say, would you swap that for your experience, Mr. Branham? No, sir. If I live 10 million years and never get a day older than 20 years old and own the whole earth and all the things in it and guarantee to never be sick in 10 million years, I'd still lay it back in her lap. I've got something greater than that. I've got eternal life. When I'm 10 million years is gone to my eternal life, I'll never even be like, it never had no beginning, so it can't end. I become a son of and you become a son and daughter of God, and God never did begin, so he never ends. 
So the Word of God must be expressed in our own being. Now, now we find out that when Jesus came to the earth, now in order to express the Word of God, he had to be a, a, a prophet because always the Word of the Lord came to the prophets. Amen. Now, we know that. Now, Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, and um, it said that Moses said, the great leader, that they, God had chose and sent down with a light above him, a pillar of fire, and had led the children into the promised land according to what he told Abraham many years before, and led him over there. He said at his time of going, Now the Lord your God shall raise up from among your brethren a prophet likened unto me. And he went ahead and told if the people who would not believe this prophet would be cut off from the congregation. And they denied him and disbelieved him, and they're cut off from the congregation. That's exactly right. Yes. Notice. So he must be a prophet. If you read in St. John 5, 19, Jesus said himself after passing by the pool of Bethesda, and there he found this man laying there, and they questioned him about healing the rest of them or whatever they did. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing that doeth the Son likewise. Now, do you believe that that's an inspired Scripture of God? Then Jesus never performed one miracle or did anything until first, by vision, he saw the Father do it. Can't make him lie and let him remain God. See, so you must believe the Word just the way it's written. There's no contradiction in it. Amen. I've asked through the years for one person to show me a contradiction. It's not there. No, the whole book of 66 wrote hundreds and hundreds of years apart by different prophets and so forth, but every word comes right together and dovetails just like that. Yeah. That's right. They don't contradict itself. It does not. So we see that the word is true. That's why you can have faith, not in a church, in an organization, but in the word. Yeah. That's the thing that isn't going to pass. And if God's ever called on the scene to make a decision... And the decision he makes first, he has to ever remain with that same decision. Now look, you and I can make a decision, and maybe after a while we find out we were wrong, so we make another decision, it's a better one. Later we find out we was wrong there, we make another decision, because we're finite, human beings of the earth, creatures of time. But God is infinite. So he cannot make better decision because every decision is perfect. If it, and if he, if it isn't, if he was called on the scene to save a man, and upon the basis he saved that man, he has to forever stay with that same basis that he saved the first man by. Yes. If he doesn't, then he done wrong when he acted the first time. Yes. And then you'd have to say, God made a mistake. Or he'd say, I'm mistaken, I oughtn't to have done that, I'll do it your way, do it this other way. Now, wouldn't that be a God? God is infinite. What was the basis God saved man on the first time? Under shed blood. And he's never changed it, and he never will change it. Yes, sir, it's the blood that saves. The The Garden of Eden, there was an innocent beast killed, shed blood, to save Adam and Eve from the torments beyond. Hell. An innocent blood. And today, though, we've tried to educate people to it. We've tried to nominate people to it. We've tried to do everything. And we find out that we separate man. But under one thing, the shed blood, we all can be brothers and sisters in Christ. Still the shed blood of an innocent one that's saved. Divine healing was based upon the first time God was ever called on the scene to heal a man. The first thing we understand was his consumption. And when he did, he based it up on the basis of, if you will believe. And he's never changed it since. Amen. It's a faith in God's promise. Therefore, it must ever remain the same. It's, you notice in Abraham's sacrifice? He separated when he made the confirmation in the 16th chapter of Genesis, when he took those, the she-goat and the heifer and cut them apart. Because the dispensations came from a lamb natural to the Lamb of God. 
But did you notice the pigeon and turtle dove he never separated? And always represented divine healing because when a leper or something was clean, they killed one bird and poured the blood up on the other and his wings went out spread, crying holy, holy to the Lord, sprinkling the earth for an atonement. And the birds was not separated because it was included in the atonement. And if the old atonement had divine healing in it, how much greater is this atonement, the new one? So there's not a question about it to God. Now here he was. He come to fulfill the Word of God, in order to fulfill the Word of God, he had to be the expression of God's Word. Now, watch what we get. We go back, we could take plenty of time, but we won't. We'll save time if we possibly can. Notice, we find his ministry starting here in St. John. And we find out, we know his birth and how that he came from the wilderness and was baptized of John and then went into the wilderness and was tempted of the devil forty days then came out of the wilderness and immediately great signs and wonders begin to set in. Now, John bare record saw the sign of the Messiah. Now, John did not go to school to learn this, though his father was a priest. His father died when he was about nine years old. Instead of going down to the regular line of his father to be a priest and so forth in all the schools, his job was too important. He must be the forerunner of the Messiah. He was to be the one to introduce him. He was prophesied by Isaiah the prophet 712 years before he was born. There would be a voice of one in the wilderness crying. And also 400 years before his birth, Micah the last prophet said, Behold, I send my messenger before my face to declare the way. Yeah. So he must not take any school's idea about it. He must go into the wilderness. And when he came back out, he stayed there until he was positive he knew the sign. And here's what he said. He that told me in the wilderness to go baptize with water said, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on. He's the one that'll baptize Amen. with the Holy Ghost and fire. He had to be positive. And friends, if Christ was coming and John had to be positive of what he was doing, let this sink down deep in your heart. We've got to be positive of this. There's all kinds of things going on. But we must be positive. You don't get to come back and try it again. You do it now or never. This is your time. Now, Jesus immediately, there was a man by the name of Andrew, a great man, fine man, a fisherman. He and his brother, Simon, they fished together. So they heard of John's ministry. And so, being religious, they'd studied the Scriptures very much together and know that there was coming a Messiah. Their father, uh, Jonas, was a, a Pharisee, a teacher. And uh, as we were told one day, he sat on the side of his little ship and said to, uh, to Andrew and to Peter, My boys, I always thought that I would live to see the Messiah. But as his gray hair blowed in the winds and his wrinkled skin, he said, I'll be gathered with my people. So I suppose I won't see him, but maybe you'll see him in your day. Now, sons, when the Messiah comes just before his coming, there will be everything taking place, all kinds of messiahs. But don't be deceived, my sons. Remember, the Bible teaches us, Moses, our, our prophet, teaches us that when Messiah will come, he will be a prophet, not an educator. Not a scholar, a prophet. The king prophet. Where all those great gifts is in those prophets will all gather in, in one Godhead. See? He'll be a king prophet. And you must remember that Moses told us not to be deceived, but the Lord God would raise up this Messiah and he would be a prophet. So when John came, they asked him, he said, Art thou that prophet? He said, I am not, but he comes after me. I'm not worthy to bear the latch on his shoes. He's coming after me. I am not that prophet, but he will come after me. And I say unto you that he's among you now. And you don't know it. And he was. He said, there's one standing among you right now who you know not. He is the one. He was so sure he's living in that day just before. He knew his job was to announce the Messiah. Yeah. 
And when he was announcing the coming of the Messiah, he noted it had to be in that age. Amen. Right there. So he said, he's among you. He's on earth today. He's standing among you. Mom, now how, wouldn't I give a bait for all the denominations of that day? Well, here we got Dr. So-and-so, Rabbi So-and-so. Look what a fine-looking young fellow he is. Look how he combs his hair, how well he speaks. Why, he, why he graduated, uh, he got his Bachelor of Art when he was only 15 years old. Well, you know that's the Messiah. See? But John would shake his head. He said, He that told me in the wilderness to go baptize the water said, Who oh, I see the Spirit on, Amen. descending this light coming down from heaven and coming up on him. That's the one. The Lord. I'm waiting to find him. One day he walked out there, and there he was. He saw him. A man of no education. Never went to school a day in his life. We don't have a record of him ever going to school. Never wrote a book. Nothing. We just hardly know he just come up and went away the same way, but he was Emmanuel. Praise Your Andrew had been following these meetings. Listen to John. And he stood there that day and heard John say, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Yes. John stood there amazed, looking at something. Here it was coming down. A voice saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am pleased to dwell in. Yes. Nobody else heard it. Nobody else saw it. But John bare record that he saw it. Amen. Why? It was promised him. Yes. The rest of the world wouldn't sit here tonight. You're promised something. Amen. And you're looking for it. Yes. And that's the reason he reveals himself the same way. So they was watching John bear record. Andrew goes home and he said to Simon that night, We have found the Messiah. Well, I can imagine Simon saying, Now wait just a minute, Andrew. We're taught better than that. Now, some wilderness so called prophet out there. Oh, it's whatever you say. And one day Simon went with him into the presence of the Lord Jesus. Now Simon was uneducated. We know the Bible said he was both ignorant and unlearned. He could not even sign his own name. That's the kind of person that God picked. And if education is such a great part, why did he, why did he pick a person like that to give him the keys to the kingdom? Yeah. See, we get off the track. Now, I'm not supporting illiteracy. I'm only stating facts. God wants a humble heart. I would rather my children know Jesus Christ as their Savior and not even know how to sign their name and have and to be the best educator there is in all the world. That's right. Notice, for that's eternal life to know Him. Here He was. Simon walked up in His presence. Said, so you just come listen at him one time. He's going to start preaching now in a few days because he come out of the wilderness and the people's begin to come. He's begin to praying for the sick and they're getting well. And won't that be the Messiah? Now look here, Andrew. The Messiah, according to the word, will be a prophet. Well, I believe John was a prophet. What sign did he show he was a prophet? He just talked. All right. But come to this person. Now, here comes Simon, Pe- Simon walking up into his presence. And as soon as Jesus saw him, he said, Your name is Simon, and you are the son of Jonas. That did it. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Note right then, that was the Messiah. Yes. Why? Not only did he know him, but he knew that godly old father, him who had kept him in the Word. Amen. See how it all dovetails together? Simon Peter quickly recognized that that was the Messiah and was given the keys to the kingdom. There was one staying there by the name of Philip. He had also been a Bible reader. And he and a man named Andrew had had much fellowship, like you people, going to the house. If you believe, how many of you study with one another? Study the Word. And you go to the house and you search the Scriptures. And they were concerned about the time they were living in. So they searched the Scriptures real close. And when they did, they found out what he was to be. And when Philip saw that, that was enough for him. Around the mountain he went, which is about 15 miles around the mountain. If you're ever in Palestine, you can mark the places. And he went around one day and come back the next. Now, when he found Nathaniel, he was in the orchard out there in his uh, grove of fig trees and was out there praying. And so here come Philip to find him. He found him on his knees praying, praying to God. 
After he got finished praying, he raised up. And he said, Nathaniel, come see who we have found. We have found the Messiah that was spoke of by Moses, the prophet, that Moses said the Lord our God would raise up. We found him. I can imagine Nathaniel saying, Philip, what do you mean? Who is it? It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, that was too much for that fellow. He said, could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? That bunch of holy rollers, or excuse me, people down there. Could it be anything good come from them? Well, we know if it come from anywhere, it would be from our denomination. Could anything good come out of there? Now, Philip, give him the best answer that anybody could give him. He said, come see. Amen. Don't stay home and criticize. Come take the scriptures and find out whether it's right or not. On the road around, I can hear their conversation. I can hear Philip say to, to Nathaniel, saying, Nathaniel, do you remember that time you bought the fish down on the river from that uh, old fisherman of the name of Simon that uh, couldn't sign that uh, receipt for you? Yes, I remember him. All right. Now, oh, I know his daddy. I bought fish from Jonah, his daddy. He's got a son named Andrew. Yes. They're both believers. And as soon as Simon came up into the presence of this Messiah, he looked him in the face and called him Simon and told him his daddy's name. Yes. Now, we know the Scripture says that the Lord's going to raise up a prophet. And we're Jews, and we're known to believe our prophets. And our Bible tells us over here also that if there be one as spiritual or prophet among you, I, the Lord, will speak to this prophet. And what he says comes to pass, then hear him. And if it doesn't come to pass, then don't hear him. And here's a man that what he says is right there on the dock to prove that it is. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if he didn't call you when you got before him. All right? When they come up in his presence, Jesus was maybe running the prayer line or whatever it was. He might have been standing out in the audience. But wherever it was when Jesus caught his eyes, he said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. Amen. That deflated him. Hallelujah. He said, Rabbi, how did you know me? Now, all of them dressed just alike. They wore beards and turbans, robes. Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Oh. Amen. What eyes? I saw you under the fig tree. You know what? That taught man of the Scripture, that predestinated seed to eternal life. When that light flashed across him, he said, Rabbi, you're the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Not his dress did it. Not his size did it. The style of his hair, the way he parted his beard... But the spirit that was in him showed that it was God, the Word made flesh, because it could discern the thoughts that's in the heart. Amen. That was Jesus yesterday. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he'll be the same. That's the way he would be today. Is that right? Amen. If that was Jesus, it would be the same Christ. See, as I have said a couple nights ago, if you could take all the life out of a peach tree and transfer the life of a pear tree into the peach tree, it would bear peaches. Sure. The kinds of life it's in it. That's what it bears. By their fruit you know them. Jesus said in St. John fourteen twelve, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Son of man. Angels ascending and ascending and so forth. You're in, you're in position. You've put yourself into position by recognizing him that... You're, you're a subject now to see greater things. Amen. Oh, if we could only get ourselves in that position to recognize Him, then we'll see healing take place in our body. Yeah. Then we'll see joy come in, and we'll see great things happen. Now, perhaps maybe His priest was standing over there. Oh, there were those standing there who didn't believe it, the teachers of those days. Standing there with their hands behind him. They know they had to answer their congregation. is already done. You know what they said? They said, this fellow is Beelzebub, the devil, fortune teller. And Jesus said, I forgive you for calling me that. But someday the Holy Ghost is coming to do the same thing. 
And to speak one word against it will never be forgiven in this world, neither in the world that is to come. That's how, since it, how it is in this last day. Amen. We've had 2,000 years of teaching. There he was. How we could continue on with these characters. But a cause of time, maybe we pick it up tomorrow night again. Notice. That's the way. Now remember, there were those there that were holy men. They were good men. They were teachers. But Jesus said, you come past seas to proselyte one person. And when you bring him into your fold, he's a two-fold more child of hell than he was to start with. He said, because... You make the commandments of God of non effect by your traditions. Yes. And that's what's the trouble of it today. We have taken a tradition and added it to the church instead of taking what God said. Yes. See, now you know that Jesus Christ didn't come the wrong way. He come exactly the way the Bible said he would come. Yes. But their traditions had it fixed in some other glamour of Christ, and he came poor and humble, just exactly what the Bible said he would do. And he did exactly the same thing and showed his Messiah sign, just exactly the way the Bible said it. But they wasn't taught to believe it that way. God, don't let us happen to skip it this time. Amen. Let's have open hearts and open minds yes. to listen. Make the Word. He was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. And the same word promised a little while, and the world seeth me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I, and I as a personal pronoun, I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the consummation. Amen. Right. And the works that I do, you'll do the same thing. Take no thought what you're going to say, because it's not you that speaks. It's the Father, the Holy Spirit, that dwells in you. He doeth the speaking. I do nothing till the Father shows me. He saw a vision. Now, the same thing applies back today. All that God was, he poured into Christ. All that Christ was, he poured into the church. It's the same God all the time. God above us, he couldn't come near us because we were sinful. The blood of lambs could not take away sin. But then God was made flesh and dwelt among us. We believe that. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Any Christian believes that. The day when they try to make him just a philosopher or a teacher, it just boils me. He was divine. Amen. He was more than a teacher or a philosopher. He was Emmanuel. God created himself a body, his son, and came down and dwelt in that body. God in Christ, not me that doeth the works, it's my Father. He shows me what to do, and I just act in His presence, in His place. St. John, oh my, Amen. it's just easy, see, to see what He's talking about. Look, when He was here on earth, He said, I come from God. I go to God. Is that right? Yes. Now, any teacher knows that that pillar of fire that followed the children in the wilderness or the, or the children of Israel followed that pillar of fire, and that was Christ. All of you believe that, don't you? It was the angel of the covenant. Moses forsook Egypt, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than that of the treasures of Egypt. It was Christ. Then here was that angel was in it. Well, he said the same thing. He told him, he said, even be, he was before Abraham was, I am. I am was the one that was with Moses in the wilderness in that bush of fire. Before a uh, St. John 6, before Abraham was, I am. And that was a moral for all generations. Not I will be, I was, I am, present tense. Amen. The same yesterday, today, and forever. His death, burial, resurrection, and one named Saul was on his road down to Damascus to arrest the people for being in this way. And about noontime, he was stricken down by light, the same light. It can't change. It has to remain the same. Yes. I come from God, made flesh. I go to God. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. How do you know it was the same God? He said, Lord, he said, Saul, Saul, I persecuted some. He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Yes. It was him that come in that night, that light, and took the shackles off of Peter and opened up the gate and took him out. The angel of the Lord. I come from God. And I go to God, making him Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's with us tonight. The same God. 
Notice in Abraham, he showed them signs all along in Abraham, but come to the master closing sign at last. Now, now remember, we're sitting here tonight. I see some of my Indian friends from up here down. There are Indians. Here's German, Swedes, Irish, all different kinds of people are what we call nationalities. But there's only, we're all come from one man. Adam, and there's only three races in the whole world, and that is Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people, for from them three at the end of living destruction, there was no one on earth. Right. Amen. And notice Peter with the keys. He opened it to the Jews at Pentecost, to the Samaritans, and then up to Cornelius, and then from that on, it was to everybody. Amen. See, that's Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. Now notice the Jews and Samaritan. The Samaritan was half Jew and Gentile. So they believed in a God, but is looking for a Messiah. And if they're looking for a Messiah, then he's duty bound to come to them. Amen. Amen. Yes. I feel pretty religious right now. Hallelujah. Know that he keeps his promise. Praise now, he came to the Jew, the elected Jew. And he made his sign known before them all. Some of them said, huh. Beelzebub, he's a fortune teller, calling the works of God an unclean spirit that could discern the thought, not knowing that the Word is a discerner of the thoughts, a prophet. For the Word of the Lord came to the prophet, made him the Word in a potion, like we are tonight. Potions of the Word. He had the full Word. Fullness of God was in him. He had it without measure. We have it by measure. But it's the same spirit. Notice. And here he stood doing exactly a Messiah sign and... Just one now and then of the Jews would believe him. Now, there were those there who would not believe him. You couldn't say they wasn't good man. No, sir. They were good men. They had to live good. You couldn't say they wasn't honest, upright, and wouldn't cheat or steal. No, sir. But them things don't save you. It's not by good works are we saved. If good works would have done it, Christ wouldn't have had to die. You see, it's a birth. You've got to be born again. You just got to be. There's no way at all out of it. Except the man be born again, he will in no wise see the kingdom. Now look, sin is not lying, stealing, drinking, committing adultery. That's not sin. That's the attributes of unbelief. The only sin there is is unbelief. The only righteousness there is is faith. Faith and unbelief, that's the only two sources it comes from. The Bible says, He that believeth not is condemned already. Amen. So they were high religious, Buddha religious. Then Mohammed's is as honest as the days is long. See? Sure, they're religious kind, nice people, but unbelievers, so that makes them sinner. And any man that don't believe every word of this Bible, the spirit in you is wrong. The Holy Ghost wrote the Bible. It said so. Hebrews, the first chapter, said, Man of old, moved by the Holy Ghost, wrote the Bible. Yes. Right. So the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Can he turn around and deny it or inject something in it that wasn't right? No. The real Holy Spirit in every man's life will punctuate every verse in that Bible with an amen. amen. The real Holy Spirit, it believes it. Now, these Samaritans were looking for a Messiah. The Jews come, he showed himself as Messiah. And when he did that, they recognized that was the Messiah. Others didn't want to because their church held him out of it. Well, you know what happened. Then there was some Samaritans. One day he was up here at Jerusalem and was going down to Jericho, which is right down the mountain, right down along the trail to Jericho. But he had need to go by Samaria. That would be like me going to my home in Indiana, but going by the way of California. Go way out of your way. I live in this direction. California, I suppose, is this way, see? Down the coast, and I have to go east. But he went up around Samaria, and he stopped at a city called Sychar. And he sent his disciples away to get food. And while they were gone into the city of Sychar, what happened? Jesus was sitting over against the hill, and out come a little woman from the city. That's found in St. John, the fourth chapter. Out come a woman from the city called the woman of Samaria. Now, listen real close. This woman come out. Now, she was a woman of bad reputation. 
Now, if we was going to say today, we'd say the lady of the red light or something. Here's what was the matter with her. She had too many husbands. She'd had five husbands and she was living with one man. So it wasn't hers. So she come out to get the water about 11 o'clock and she looked over and saw a Jew that said, woman, bring me a drink. Well, she said, we have and so much. We got segregation here. Why, you shouldn't ask me that. I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew. We have no deeds with one another. What's he doing now? Now you have to take my word. He's contacting her spirit. The father told him to go up there. But now here's the only person that he's seen. So she comes. That must be the one. So he's contacting her spirit. He said, um, uh, she said, well, our fathers drink. He said, first, he said, I'd, if you'd ask me, I'd give you water so you don't come here to draw. He said, oh, the well's deep. You have nothing to draw with. He began to talk to her. See, he was catching her spirit. And she said, why, you worship at Jerusalem, we worship in this mountain, and so forth. He said, the hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in truth and spirit. He caught what her trouble was. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. He said, you've told the truth. For you've had five husbands, and the one you're now living with is not your husband. Look at that little woman. She know more about God than half the preachers of this day. In her condition. She stopped. She was amazed. Look at them. Look at those priests back there. said, this man's Beelzebub, a fortune teller. But that little prostitute woman stopped and said, Sir, I perceive that thou art that prophet. We know when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. Jesus yesterday. Look what she done. She left the water pot. She ran into the city and she said to those men, Come see a man that told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? In other words, isn't this the sign that the Messiah is to show? Look at the difference. When that light, that spirit swept across that little predestinated seed laying there to ordain to eternal life, them religious teachers that never bothered them a bit, they thought so much of their uh, way of doing things that this couldn't had to be their way or no way at all. But when he struck that little prostitute, she had been ordained to life. She said, we know, we are taught, we believe. Amen. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. Yes. Who art thou? He said, I'm he. That was enough. Amen. That was it. Here she saw the sign done. She knew it was Messiah. She ran into the city and told the man, Come see this man. Isn't this the very sign that the Messiah is supposed to do? See? And the Bible said the people of that city believed on him because of the testimony of the woman. He never had to do one more thing. The woman witnessed it's the truth. He told me I had five husbands. And you men know that I have. That's it. And he was Messiah. Now, if that was the way they know him yesterday, and he's the same yesterday, day for, you say, what about yesterday? Paul was writing the Hebrews in the Bible time. Yesterday, it was God that was in the prophets. Do you believe that? Amen. Look at David going up over the mountain, a rejected king, weeping. About 500 years after that, the son of David sat on the same mountain, weeping. Rejected king. Yeah. Look at Joseph, sold for 30 pieces of silver. Almost 30 pieces of silver. Look at him. When he was born, he was a prophet. He could prophesy, foretell things to come, interpret dreams, spiritual, loved of his fathers, hated of his father, and hated by his brothers. Exactly what Jesus was. Yeah. See? And was thrown into a pit and supposed to be dead, taken up instead of the right hand of Pharaoh. No man in his prison, like Jesus, nailed to a cross in his prison. There was one lost, one saved. And Joseph, there was one lost, one saved. And he ascended up by the side of Pharaoh, and no man could come to Pharaoh only by Joseph. Jesus ascended up in heaven, and no man comes to the Father only by Jesus. And when Joseph left the throne to go out, the trumpet sounded, and every knee bowed. Bow the knee, Joseph is coming. And when Jesus leaves the throne, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. See? That was a spirit a Messiah in those men. That's reason the Word of God came to the prophet. And here the full Word of God was manifested in order to redeem man. Now, if that's what he was yesterday, that's what he was today, then Paul said he will be the same forever. So we see. Now, there come forth the Jew and the Samaritan. 
But we Gentiles, we wasn't looking for no Messiah. We were Romans and Anglo-Saxon, worshiping idols and so forth. We wasn't looking for no Messiah, so he never showed himself. Not one time did he do that before a Messiah, uh, before a Gentile. Find it in the Bible. Not one time. Why? I remember he can't change. And at the end of the Jewish dispensation and those, if he proved that to be himself and let the Gentiles go through just on theology without seeing the same thing, then he isn't God. He did something there at the end of their race and their time that he didn't do here. Now, did he promise it? Yes, quickly now. Now I'll close. Jesus said in St. Luke, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. You know that. Let's watch Sodom. Abraham, type of the church. Remember, there's always three classes of people. That's believers, make-believers, and unbelievers. It's an ever crowd. Here they come. Abraham had come a long time and seen great wonders before God, great signs. Now, he represents the church elected. God gave Abraham the covenant without any strings tied to it, saved him in his grace, by his grace unconditionally. Abraham and his seed. See? You don't seek God, God seeks you. You said, I sought and sought. No, no, it was God seeking you. Just you wouldn't turn loose, that's all. See? That's all. God seeks man, not man seeking God. The very nature of man showed in the Garden of Eden. When he sinned, instead of coming out and confessing it, he run. It wasn't Adam running through the garden hollering, God, God, where are you? It was God saying, Adam, Adam, where are thou? See? Same thing today. See? It's God seeking man. No man can come unless my Father draws him first. See? Now, <clears throat> here they were. Now, Abraham had seen great things before God. Now, Abraham had a relative, a nephew, which was Lot. And Lot had took his choice down living like the world in Sodom. You know the story? There was the Sodomites, unbelievers. There was lukewarm believers, Lot and his family. Here was Abraham and his family positionally sitting here. The time had come for the fire to fall. What happened? Listen close now. I'm closing. One day there was three angels came up before the camp of Abraham. One of them was God himself. Abraham called him Elohim, which is God, my Lord, capital L-O-R-D, self-existing one. Came up. Two of them went down into Sodom and preached the gospel and tried to draw them out. All that believes that say amen. amen. We believe that. Lot came out. Remember how strict his word was. Even the angel said, don't even look back. And Lot's wife turned to look back because her children and grandchildren were burning up in the judgments of God. She turned and she stands there yet today. Yeah. You've got to obey. He said, oh, it don't make no difference. Well, it does make a difference. Because a woman just disbelieved a little bit of the Word caused every sickness, heartache, death, and everything else is Eve. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. She had a lot more to look back for than what we have. Her children and grandchildren were burning up in the fires of God's judgment. And she, that mother just turned to look back, only she's commanded not to do it by that angel. And he turned back anyhow, and she stands today, pillar of salt. A disgrace all through the years. Notice, now, these angels came, and two of them went out and preached to Lot and to his family. They didn't do much of a miracle. They did a few miracles, just like blinding eyes, when they come to get them and preaching the gospel blinds the eyes of the unbeliever. But they were preaching, come out of here! Get out of Sodom! But listen, the one that was talking to Abraham didn't say come out of Sodom because he and his group wasn't in Sodom. That's the church elected. Amen. Now, remember, Jesus said, as it was in that day, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now, listen close. And uh, how many of you here is born again? Let's see your hand. Spirit, all right. You should be able to take meat now. <laughs> Listen close. As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, these two messengers, outstanding messengers, went in there. Lot said to give his message, but it sounded nothing to them. They didn't pay attention to him. Because the life he lived proved it. Lukewarm church, even his own children didn't even believe in him. But when these messengers went in, they seen that they were godly man. And if Sodom hasn't received their 
godly man today and an Oral Roberts and a Billy Graham, I never know one. Yeah. Godly man, shaking them out. Look at Billy Graham, that great evangelist. Out in Sodom there, blasting away, doing no miracles. But get out of here! Repent or perish! He cries. Yeah. And listen, we've had great men down through the ages. We've had Moody, Wesley, Sankey, Finney, Knox, Calvin, all the way down. But never did we have a messenger to that church nominal that ended his name the same way Abraham was to show that he was the seed of Abraham. Yeah. G-R-A-H-A-M. Yeah. To the church nominal. We've had all kinds of names, but never that name. This is it. Yeah. And now there was a messenger sent to the church elected. Abraham. Watch what he did. He sat up there. And he said, Abraham, now remember, a day before his name was Abram. And his wife's name was S-A-R-A-I, Sarah. Changed it to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. And his name was Abram to Abraham. Watch this messenger. Now it looked like a man, clothes on, dust on his clothes, sitting, eating veal chops and drinking milk and eating butter and bread. Right. Yeah. It was God Amen. sitting there. And he said, Abraham, where is your wife Sarah, S-A-R-A-H? How did he know his name had been changed from Abram to Abraham? How did he know he had a wife? And how did he know her name was Sarah? And Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. Notice the Bible specifically said, behind him. Watch here. Here proves I, personal pronoun, I'm going to visit you according to the time of life like I promised you. See who it was? It was a God that had been talking to him all along down the journey. Yes. The 25 years they've been believing. I'm going to visit you according. And Sarah now, she was 90 years old and Abraham was 100. They, they didn't have any um, uh, uh, married life as husband and wife. You know what I'm saying, you adults. See, that, they, that ceased with them years ago because it was well stricken. And she laughed in herself. What we call in the, in the States, laughed up her sleeve, you know. Me, an old woman, and my husband sitting out there old too, and we will have pleasures again as a young married couple. And the angel, with his back turned to the tent, said, Why did Sarah laugh? Yeah. Saying that these things Amen. could not be. See what a sign that church got? They had all other kind of signs, but that was the last one. Yeah. Then when Abraham's seed through Isaac, the natural seed, Jew, came to the end of their line, here was that same God manifested in flesh, showing his Messiah sign the same thing. Amen. Now here comes the Gentiles, the royal seed of Abraham through Christ, at the end of their age with 2,000 years of teachings. Amen. Now, the Pentecostals come on with speaking in tongues, interpretations, and so forth. They've had all kinds of miracles. But remember, here we are. We're at the end of the age receiving the same sign that they did back there at the end of the age, just before the fire falls. Yeah. Sirs, we would see Jesus. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What would you look for that life that was in Christ would be in his church? Yeah. See, God, that man was God. Represent himself in human flesh, in human form. Today, God represents himself in the human flesh of his church. Amen. God, the Holy Ghost, in his church, moving through his church, speaking with tongues, interpreting the tongues, healing the sick. And then the last sign, the word so manifested, tell us the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. How many see that and believe Amen. that to be the truth? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our hearts are full of joy tonight to know that Jesus still is. Two thousand years of criticism can never change him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Educational programs have tried to change him. Great denominations have come up and tried to, tried to change it. But he's the unchangeable God. He changes not. One day after his death, burial, and resurrection... There were two friends walking down the road, troubled hearts, on an Easter morning. They said, talking about his death and his burial, how could he ever stand to die 
and being who they thought he was. And a man stepped out of the bushes and began to talk to him. They didn't know who it was. But when the evening time come, about this time of the evening, they asked him to come in to an inn and stay all night with him. Ask, and you shall receive. They closed the doors. And there at the table he did something just the way he did it before his crucifixion. And they recognized that no man could do that like him. So they knew it was Jesus. And he vanished out of their sight. And they run and told the other disciples, Truly, the Lord is risen. And they said, Did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us along the road? Grant it again tonight, Father. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I had begun to notice the people leaving and not noticing. Your, your night time comes too quick up here, see? Uh, down home at, at this time of night, oh, it's been dark for hours at home. But here it looks like it, you just get laid down, the sun's just going down, you have to get up again. So it's, uh, I'm sorry to have kept you so long. We'll just call a short prayer line tonight and pray for the sick. I know this will be new. Now I'm going to ask you for something to do. And let me say, if everyone will just remain seated just for the next 15 minutes, we'll be grateful to you. See? Now, these Indians sitting here on the front has been in the meetings before, yesterday. But I suppose many of you white people here and so forth, you've never been in one of the meetings. But remember, he remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now, if he will only come into our midst here and show that he is the same. Now, a dress wouldn't make any difference. It's the life, the action that makes him the same. He's acting in his church. No matter how it acts through me, he's got to act through you too because the two of us make up the unity of him. You've got to believe. When he was on earth, there's many mighty miracles he couldn't do because of people's unbelief. You've got to believe him. And then between the two, between you and I and the others believing, then we see Christ manifested among us. Now, quickly, usually we do it a little different. But tonight I believe that Billy Paul told me, where's he at? That he give out prayer, or did he give out prayer cards? He isn't here. Did he give out prayer cards? Did he? All right. Look on the back and see what kind of a letter is it. Is it A, B, C, or what is it? What is it? V, V, all right. And um, I suppose... Uh, at, uh, at uh, somebody calling, has it, uh, has it got five or six or eight or ten or fifteen or twenty or thirty or something like that? Don't, has anybody got one of those numbers? Just say yes. All right, then it's from one up to there. Then Let's call from number one, then. Who has prayer card number one? Would you just raise up your hand? This man here? Come over here, sir. Number two. Prayer card number two. Would you raise up your hand wherever you are? Prayer card number two. B. Like in Victoria, B, number two. Two, in B. B, number two. All right. B, number three. If you can't get up, we'll call you. The lady here, all right. Come over here, lady. V, number four. Who has that? Number four. Would you raise up your hand? It'd help us a whole lot. Oh, I'm sorry. Over here. Number five. This is we. That's right. That's right. Number six. Prayer card number six. Six. Does everybody speak English? Where's Brother Eddie? Everybody speak English? See, six. I was out today at a lunch counter, and uh, there's I, one company over here speaking one language, one over here another, and the waiter speaking another language. So I, I, I know there's a... Mix up in the language here. What? Six? Seven. That's right. Sometimes they're deaf and can't hear it. Then I get a letter to the office say, they, they, nobody told me I was deaf. Uh, seven. Eight. Eight. All right. Nine. Nine. Prayer card number nine. Um, look at your neighbor. See if he's got a card. Look like this. It may be that it's deaf now, or maybe he's crippled and just can't get up, you see, or something like that. Then we'll have to pack him. Number nine. They have, I've spoke lengthily, and there been several has went out. Maybe it was. Now, they'll miss their number. Number ten. The lady there. 
Number 11. 11. Oh, my. The, oh, the little girl. Well, bless you. Number 12. Over here. Number 13. 13. Could I... You look around again now. See if nobody's deaf or can't raise up. Number 13. Let's stop at that. Now, <clears throat> please, when you get your cards, don't take a card unless you're going to stay. And cause it. Now, tomorrow night we'll call from somewhere else, you see. Maybe come, 50 come back and 20 go the other way or something like that, you see. You'll miss it all together. And they're not exchangeable. You must keep them. Now, the boy comes down here every afternoon, takes the cards up here before you all, and mix them all up together. And just give you a card, anybody that wants one, until he gives out so many of them. But how many knows that people get healed more out in the audience than is up on the platform? How many is every one of our meetings before? Raise your hand. Oh, there's a number of you. Well, my, why didn't I take another subject tonight, then? You know what? See? My, I didn't know I was among them fine. All right? Then you people out there believe with all your heart. How many out there does not have a prayer card, and yet you believe God will heal you? Raise up your hand and say, I believe. All right? Let me tell you something what the Bible says now. The Bible said that one time a little woman, say she didn't have a prayer card, but she believed that he was the Son of God. And she said, if I can just touch the border of his garment, I'll be made whole. How many remembers the story? And when he touched her, when she touched him, he turned around. And he said, who touched me? And all, See, he didn't know. Jesus wouldn't lie. He said, who touched me? And no one knew. So after a while, he looked around over the audience. Her faith, because she felt within her that her blood issue had stopped. Her faith had healed her. She couldn't hold it. Her faith had done it. So her faith in Christ, he called her and told her that her faith had saved her. Is that right? Amen. Now listen close. If he is the same as he was yesterday, how many believe that the Bible says that he is now a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? Well, how would he act if you touched him? The same as he did then. Is that right? So you pray now, you without the prayer cards or whatever more, you pray and believe and say, Lord God, let me touch you and speak to Brother Branham. You are the Holy Spirit. You're here. I got faith in you. Brother Branham's got faith in you. He was sent here to tell us to, and said it, and it was about what Christianity was. Now, let you speak to him like you did, and I'll believe it. Amen. Now, uh, all right. Now, be real reverent. Don't move around, please. <clears throat> now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take every spirit in here under my control for God's sake, in the sake of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've followed the meetings anywhere, you know what happens. Something could happen terribly. You know, you see it happen. So sit real still and just quickly answer. Do whatever he tells you to do now. The angel of the Lord is near. Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, any of you ever see the picture of that angel they've got in Washington, that light, that angel of the Lord? They've got it here, I suppose. A man has got it here. Now, if that is the same spirit here as it was then, it'll manifest the Word like it did then. Is that right? Because that was Jesus in the wilderness. It was Jesus when it was made flesh. When he resurrected, he was Jesus. When it returned back in the form of the Holy Ghost, it was still Jesus. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, there's no one in the building that I know. I don't know these boys sitting here. They're the Indian boys from up here at the reservation. But uh, they was in the meeting. I know they, they're from up there. But I, I don't know their names. And outside of that... There is, uh, I know there's some people in here. I got a couple of, I believe that's Brother Borders, his father, sitting right there. I, I think that's right, right on the corner. And, uh, and that's another brother. I forget his name and his wife and baby sitting right back there. But they're from over here somewhere. I met him a couple of days ago. And outside of that, I don't see anyone in here that I, Brother Eddie and 
This man and woman just sitting right here, they played music. Everybody in this prayer line that knows I don't know nothing about you, raise up your hand. It's in the prayer line here. Put your hands up if you if, if I don't know nothing about you, raise up your hands. All out there in the audience that knows I know nothing about you, raise up your hands. Praise the Lord. You are? Now, here stands a man for our first time meeting. I don't or he might have been in a meeting somewhere or something like that. But I mean to know him, I don't know him. God knows him. I don't know him. But here we meet for the first time. Now, I don't know what you're here for. Can you hear me all out over the audience? See? All right. Now, listen real close now. I don't know that Christ will do it. But if he does it, then that shows that we would see Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christianity, I said a while ago, was convincing. When it's taught in the simplicity of the Word and then lived out the way it's supposed to be lived. As Christ, not the Christian, the Christ in the Christian believer. Now, if you were here for financial trouble, I'd be very little help I could be for you. If you're here for domestic trouble, I wouldn't know how to make a time to talk with you and your wife if you have one. If it's here for sickness, there's nothing I could do about it, only lay my hands up on you. But what if you say you was here for sickness, and I come up and say you had a cancer, and I come up I said, Mister, what's the matter with you? You say, I got a cancer, sir. Glory to God, Jesus said, these signs shall follow them believe. Lay hands on the sick. Hallelujah. They shall recover. Bless the Lord. Go on. Yeah, that could be true. See? That could be the truth. See? We have nothing to say against that. But now what you would have a wonder to about that, brother. But now what if Christ comes and tells you what you have been or something that you have done or tells you what's your trouble or something like he did in the Bible I talked about tonight? Then you know that had to come from supernatural power. Is that right? Would the audience believe that? Amen. Have to come supernatural. Because here's the Bible over my heart. As far as I've ever seen the man, God in heaven knows I've never seen him as far as I know. Unless I pass him on the street or he's set in a meeting somewhere or something like that. But to know him, I do not. That's right. Here we stand. Now, the Holy Spirit revealed to me your trouble or something about it. Then we'll know that we have seen the same Christ. Now, you know it'll have to be supernatural power. All of you know that. Some of you can say, well, it's not of God. All right. That's what the Pharisees said. You have that kind of reward. If it is God, you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost and there's no forgiveness for it. See? Now, if you believe it is God, then you receive God's reward. Yes. Remember, not me, it's Him. Yes. See? Him, Christ. Yes, sir? You can see there's that light right around Him right now. He's aware of that. Real sweet, kind feeling around you. That's right. Raise up your hand. That's right. Can't you see that light? Emerald. Here he is. He's been under this affliction for a long time. It's a nervous condition. You've been in such a fix that you haven't been able to work for a long time. Just breaking down constantly. I, every meeting, I get somebody that won't mind. Why do you doubt? Somebody said he guessed that. I didn't guess it. When Simon Peter came to our Lord, he told him who he was. You believe God can tell me who you are? Would it make you realize that I've told you the truth then, that your nervousness is finished? I do. You do? Mr. Ripping, go believe with all your heart and be made glad. You believe him? Believe Christ? Now, now ask him. Do you know the man? Ask him. Be real reverent. Please don't walk around. See, your spirit, and when you move, it's under contact, and it just keeps pulling me. Just sit there and believe. Have faith. Just stand another few minutes. How do you do, lady? We are strangers to one another. We were, you know, I guess you're just a little older than I, and probably born years apart and miles apart. Here we meet for the first time. Like our Lord met a woman one time at the well, St. John 4, Sychar. And he 
talked to her long enough to find out what her trouble was and told her what her trouble was, and she believed it. And she went and said, come see a man who's told me what my trouble is. Isn't that the Messiah? Would you believe the same thing? You and I meeting together. Would every woman in here believe the same thing? Here's my hand on the Bible. I've never seen the woman know nothing about her. But here she stands. Seems like a nice person. Yes, the lady is suffering one thing. I see her trying to get out of the bed. It's arthritis. She has arthritis. And then another thing, you're hard of hearing. You don't hear too good. That's right. Another thing, you've got trouble with your face. I see you've had an operation. Your husband out there is sick too. That's right. You believe now he's going to make you well? All right, go believe it and you can have what you want. Hallelujah. Have. In the name of the Amen. Lord. Amen. You believe? Amen. Have faith. Don't doubt. Amen. Believe with all that's in you now. If thou canst believe, how do you do? I'm a stranger to you. You're a stranger to me. Christ knows us both. Presuming, looking at you, you're an Indian. You're an Indian. All right? Now, here we meet like, here's, here's exactly St. John 4. Here is a white man and an Indian woman meeting here together like Jesus being a Jew and her a Samaritan. He let her know right quick that God was God of all races. And that's right. Now, if God will reveal to me what's in your heart or something about you, you'll know whether it's the truth or not. Will you accept him and believe it with all your heart and believe that he is the resurrected Messiah and it's his spirit doing this? You will believe it? May God grant your request. I see a little one. It's a baby. You're praying for a baby. Your baby. It's in the hospital. And you believe God can tell me what's the baby, matter with the baby? It's got heart trouble. And you're praying that God will spare it. Don't doubt it. God gives you your request. Go now. Let your baby get well. Now, don't doubt it. Believe with all your heart. Are you believing? Have faith. Don't doubt it. We are strangers to each other. The Lord God knows both of us, though. He did something in the audience, and I didn't catch it just then. Somebody praying. Just have faith. Don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. Because He is God. He cannot fail. Look here just a minute. Being, if I could help you and wouldn't do it, then I wouldn't be fit to stand behind the pulpit here with the Bible. That prostrate trouble leaves you. Believe with all your heart. God makes you well. What did you touch? The border of his garment. You believe. Isn't he wonderful? Arthritis. Man sitting looking at me, glasses on. If you believe with all your heart, God will make you well. You believe it? You accept it? God bless you. You have a prayer card? You don't need one. Your faith makes you whole. <laughs> what did he touch? See? He was sitting there praying. And he touched the high priest. The high priest turns back to his church and speaks. Sir, we would see Jesus. Don't you see that he's alive? We're not serving a dead God. He's a live God. That's him. That's his presence. What he promised right here, the church getting its last sign just before the fire falls now. 
Just have faith. Don't doubt. Now, here's a little lady. I do not know her. I've never seen her. We're perfect strangers. But if the Lord God will reveal to me something about the woman, will it make all of you believe and you'll know he's here? you believe it with all your heart? Not knowing you, but yet God knowing you. And in his presence as we stand, you're a Christian, and you're suffering with a weakness, a heart trouble like. You're, it's just a weak heart. There's something strange about you. I see rolling waters. See, you are a missionary. Yes. And you're trying to gain strength to go back yes. to a place. It's, uh, low, it's, it's Brazil. Believe with all your heart. And you can go back and preach the gospel in Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, believe with all your heart. Just don't doubt, but believe with all your heart that our Lord God and Heavenly Father is your. What if I didn't even say nothing to you? You just laid hands on you. Would you believe you'd get well? Would you do it? I know you. Did. You did right there. Well, you, you got healed when you sat in your seat when you got up. That real strange feeling come over you. I seen you tuck your place in the prayer line. It's over. Go. God bless you. Come. When she raised up, that light struck her. That reason I said immediately, here was the angel of the Lord. How do you do? Do you believe God heals heart trouble, makes people well? He heals your heart too. So just go on by and thank you, Lord, and believe with all your heart, and God will make you well. How do you do? You believe me to be his prophet, his servant? You do? God heals arthritis too, don't he? He makes you well too. You believe it? All right. Go on. Your arthritis will leave you. Have faith. God. Tuck off your glasses before you got here. All right. But well, that's not the main thing. You want to go eat your supper and that old stomach trouble to leave and you get well? Go eat. Jesus Christ. Make you well. Believe now with all your heart. This woman is a nervous woman. Very nervous. And it's got to a place to her stomach is bothering her from it. It's a nervous stomach, peptic condition in, in the stomach. You believe that you can go eat now? You accept it and believe it? All right. Go believe then. Now look, it's really not your stomach. It's your nerves. So you just got to take a hold of faith and go on out there and be well. Jesus Christ will make you well if you believe. All right. Bring the little girl. How do you do? You're a sweet little girl. Do you believe that when Jesus was here, he tucked little girls like you and laid his hands up on them? And... uh, they had that old scientist as bad as you got it. Do you believe they get well? Do you believe he sent me to lay my hands on you? Amen. All right, you got it. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I condemn that devil that's bothering his child. May it leave her this asthmatic condition and never return again. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go on. You'll get well and believe God with all your heart. Come up, sister. How do you do? We're strangers, but God knows us both. Is that right? Now... Women about your age usually have a nervous condition anyhow. You've had it for quite a little bit. And uh, it's left you with a bad stomach. Can't eat. See you backing away from the table, leaving things. That, but you don't have to do that no more now. He makes you well. Go eat. Amen. Believe with all your heart. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you believe with all your heart out there? Amen. If you can believe, all things are possible. The man sitting here beside of a lady looking at her right at me, a prostrate trouble, nervous, getting up at nights. You thought he'd miss, but he didn't. You was praying for that. Raise up your hand if that's so. God bless you. It's all over now. Go home. Rest good tonight. Jesus Christ makes you well. Sirs, we would see Jesus. Do you believe him? How many believers are in the building? Raise up your hand. Jesus said this also. These signs shall follow believers. Is that right? Amen. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Is that what he said? Well, if he's here now and you see that he's here, won't he keep his word to you? Then lay your hands over on one another. Just put your hands over on one another. Right? That's right. Lay your hands on one another. You that want to believe. Amen. Now, if you are a believer, you pray for the person you got your hands on. Yes, sir, was that TV? Don't worry about it no more. It's gone. 
Have faith. Go back to your reservation, praising God. It's all over. I challenge you to believe it. Jesus Christ is a living tonight. He's here in our midst right now. You, you pray for the person you got your hands on because they are praying for you. Let us bow our heads now. Our Heavenly Father, we are so blessed tonight to see the great Holy Spirit come to us here on this island tonight and manifest Himself as a resurrected Lord, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Believers are sitting here. They have their hands laid on each other. They're praying one for the other. While your presence is here, oh God, can people be so numb of spirit until they can't recognize your presence? Then we know, Lord, they're lost eternally. But Father, this people here that believe that you are here and they're ready to receive you, they have their hands laid on each other. I have gotten weak. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll send confirmation of faith into their heart to receive Christ, the great healer, into their heart while he's present. Grant it. And Satan, you who bound them with these infirmities and diseases, I resent you. You are a defeated being. You are exposed here. People who has listened to you knows tonight that you're exposed and you no more can hold them. You're just lying. And we take the preeminences by saying that we stand in the name of Jesus Christ who rose up from the grave and by his blood and life he conquered and stripped you of every authority you had. You have no authority. You're a bluff. And we call you to lead this people in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out of them that they be made whole. Hallelujah. A prayer of faith shall save the sick and God shall raise them up. If you are a genuine believer and believe that you're in the presence of Christ and won't accept your healing, I don't care how crippled you are, what your trouble is, stand on your feet in faith believing in Jesus Christ will make you whole. Stand up. No matter what's wrong, stand up anyhow if you believe it. Amen. There's the whole audience on their feet. Here he is, the great Holy Spirit moving among you. Uh, I love him, I love him because he first loved me. Let's raise our hands and give him praise now. I love him. I love him. Because he first loved me. Do you love him? Raise up your hands and praise him and tell him that you love him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your kindness, for your mercy, for the faith of this people. God, comb this great big city. Get out among here, we pray, the people will, Lord, and we'll bring in the sick, blind, halt, lame, and afflicted, and may the power that raised Jesus out of the grave come forward and prove to this island before it's too late that Jesus Christ is alive and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now give him praise. Raise up your hands and praise him, and God be with you till we meet.